Good evening and welcome to the September 8th, 2020 regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council. Uh, first item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance and we're going to have Kirk Eby from our Planning Code Department lead us in the pledge. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, all right, are we ready? I pledge allegiance to the, the flag. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> A little nervous, sorry. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate it. Um, next item on our agenda is reflection and I'm just going to call for a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. Um, next we have uh, approval of minutes and tonight we have one set of minutes to approve. It is the regular session uh, from Monday, August 3rd. What is the pleasure of the council? Someone would like to make the motion, just raise your hand. Rob Wu, go right ahead. Mr. Mayor, move approval. Okay. Second. Second from Lori Ann Sales. I'll call the roll. All in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Uh, council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Sesma. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Councilmember Spiegel? Aye. And Councilmember Sales? Aye. Okay, that carries unanimously. Um, and next, we have public comments. Um, and tech team, if you'd like to play your how-to video, that would be great. Good evening. If you've connected to the meeting tonight via Zoom, and you're on a desktop or a laptop, and you wish to make a public comment, we can't currently see or hear you. What you need to do, please, is wiggle your mouse around and look towards the bottom center of your screen. You should see a raise hand button. Go ahead and click on that now for us, please. Alternatively, if you've connected in via telephone, you can press star 9. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, and I see one hand up. Um, tech team, if you could bring up Christine Dibble. Um, and Christine, when you come up, just unmute yourself state your name and address or neighborhood for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Ashman. Uh, hold on one second. I'm just trying to uh, not see the tech team screen. Hold on one minute, I apologize. Um, and how long do I have to speak? Three minutes. Three minutes, okay, I was afraid of that. Um, <laughs> All well, right, well, let's... so tech team, just pause the, pause the clock for a sec. Uh, Christine, yeah, I could keep it to three minutes or okay. thereabouts. Three and minutes you, and 15 seconds, I promise. If you have more, you can always submit it to us in writing. It'll be com considered just the same. Go right I ahead. I understand that. Um, hold on a second. I still would like to be able to see. Escape. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, good evening, uh, Mayor Ashman and Council members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to let me speak with you this evening. My name is Christine Dibble, it's D I B B L E, and I live about three quarters of a mile from the Duval Funeral Home in Washington Grove. I'd like to speak tonight to you about my objections to the construction of and the review process for the crematorium that's proposed for 14 East Deer Park Drive. Um, specifically, I'd like to address two different shortcomings. The first shortcoming pertains to zoning, specifically the city's decision to interpret the existing ordinances that apply to the CD, that is the Corridor Development Zone, to permit the siting of crematoria. The ordinances permit all uses in the CD zone other than uses that are specifically prohibited. And uses that are prohibited include virtually all production, manufacturing, assembly and processing, light industry facilities. Um, although a crematorium is not specifically referred to in the list of light industry facilities, that is in the ordinances, a crematorium to me is clearly a production manufacturing assembly and processing facility. A cremation chamber is a furnace that processes human bodies into ash, potentially emitting toxic substances like furans, um, PAHs, which are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, mercury, and particulate matter. 
Um, I strongly recommend that the city amend the ordinances at your earliest convenience to address the siting of crematoria in all city zones. And I urge you to require that any crematorium be set back at least 500 feet from the closest residence. I've done a search of municipal zoning ordinances in the United States that make specific mention of crematoria. And most of these ordinances exclude the siting of any crematoria anywhere. Those ordinances that do permit them generally require a setback of at least 500 feet. But in this case, the Deval cremation chamber would be about 150 feet from the closest residence, less than a third of what is elsewhere mandated. Um, since my time is running out, I've only got about 30 seconds left. Um, I just want to let you know that I think another shortcoming of this process pertains to the environmental justice aspects of the matter. And um, I, you know, I really have an issue with the fact that this crematorium is being located in what is the, the less wealthy part of Gaithersburg. And that a lot of, um, uh, a lot of constituents may um, uh, Christine, see this. Christine, yes. I think, can you, can you just wrap it up with one sentence yeah, here? Absolutely. Um, a lot of your constituents will perceive this as unfair based on their race and their lack of income. Okay. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. Um, appreciate it. Let me just see. Is there are there any other hands up? I don't see any any others. Um, so let me just a couple little responses to that, and we'll we'll move forward. Uh, one, it's my understanding that that the the folks at Duval are hosting a community meeting to discuss concerns like the ones you just brought up. Uh, tomorrow night. I'm not exactly, does anybody on the Zoom know where this is going to take place or is it on a Zoom or I'm not sure. I, I, I just, I, I believe that there is a community meeting that's happening tomorrow evening um, hosted by Duvall who has filed this application. Um, second, um, I will, I'll just say in terms of the last point about um, environmental justice and one side of the city versus the other, I mean, the fact is, uh, according to our law, if somebody files an application of this type, we are required to consider it. It is required, it is required that we go through a process to consider it. That is what we are doing. Um, it ha just so happens that Duval is located where it is located but that, that is of no matter to us. It doesn't matter who the, the applicant is, we are legally obligated to consider it. Um, and then, uh, Lynn, I, you know, I don't know if you wanted to make any points about, about the CD zone or if you just want to let the comments stand. Um, go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, I do want to make uh, one clarification. Uh, Maryland law is fairly clear that you can't um, change your zoning laws in the midst of considering an application. You would have to change them prior to the application in order for them to be uh, effective to that particular application. So even if we did start a, a amendment process to the zoning ordinance, it would not be applicable to this particular application. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and I'll, I'll note just, to, just further that we've received a lot of correspondence there's a, there's a big record of uh, feedback from the public. I know the council members uh, have read every bit of it and, and um, have, you know, have heard, uh, Christine, I can't remember if yours is one of them, probably it is, um, but we've certainly heard similar arguments and they're all being considered. Um, and with that, the next item on our agenda is from the mayor and council and we will go, we're gonna start with uh, council vice president sales. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, welcome back from Labor Day, the Labor Day holiday. Um, uh, we missed everyone over the weekend. We're usually busy all across the city between the parade, um, the Kentlands 5K, um, and so just want everyone to um, uh, reflect on um, all of the uh, laborers who are still laboring uh, during the pandemic 
Um, tremendous uh, thanks to our city staff um, and all others uh, who are keeping us informed by delivering our mail on time, uh, keeping our broadband connections secure so we can continue, continue to meet um, as we uh, socially distance ourselves. Um, those that are keeping us safe and healthy and uh, um, most importantly, our frontline workers who are risking their lives every day um, to test us and care for us and uh, prevent uh, the spread of um, this virus and other diseases we uh, approach flu season. Um, and so just want to uh, thank everyone who's still uh, working on our behalf. Um, also, the uh, world is mourning the loss of a hero. Um, over the weekend, we found out that uh, Chadwick Boseman, who's uh, popularly known for um, movie roles, including um, James Brown, Thurgood Marshall. Um, he recently passed, um, also known as the Black Panther, uh, most popularly known as the Black Panther. Um, I'm thinking about all of the other people that we've lost this year and um, almost 189, 190,000 deaths um, in the United States from the pandemic. Um, and numbers are going to surpass uh, 200,000 by election day. Um, and so if you are outside of the home, please continue to wear your mask, uh, follow the guidance of our health experts, um, continue to socially distance um, and wash your hands. Um, and we hope to uh, see everyone soon. Um, one last note, uh, the city um, had their first day of uh, testing at the Lake Forest Mall last week, Wednesday. And so I did get a chance to go through and get tested. The process was uh, very easy. It took me less than 10 minutes to uh, get swabbed. I swabbed myself and still waiting for the results, but um, there's testing all across the county. And so you can just go to the county's website to learn more and our website as well to learn about the uh, schedule for regular testing here in the city. Um, and that is all I have for now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lorianne. Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it, for those who are interested in getting tested, uh, Lorianne's right. Check the website because it's not every day. Um, it is at this point, I believe it's once a week, um, but we're we're hoping it will be available more off, more often soon. Uh, we'll go to Council Member Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'll keep it brief. A couple of things. Uh, one is uh, related to diseases going around. Where uh, aside from the pandemic that we're all very aware of, it's getting to be the start of uh, flu season. Uh, flu shots are widely available. I had mine a couple of weeks ago at uh, one of the local pharmacies. They can do it right then and there. And usually they'll even give you a coupon for $5 off whatever you buy afterwards. So they pay you to take the flu shot. Uh, it's, uh, this year I had absolutely no reaction. So uh, it's a good thing to get and make sure that you don't get sick this year. Um, one event that I attended virtually over the last couple of weeks was the uh, Gaithersburg Germantown Chambers uh, Public Safety Awards, which is always a nice pancake breakfast, but we went without the pancakes this year and did a virtual thank you to our police, fire, and other first responders for their bravery and heroic acts and general helpfulness in, in helping our populace this last year. Uh, Police have had a bit of a rough year with a lot of negative publicity, but there were a lot of really uh, great things that were brought up that our local police officers from Gaithersburg and Montgomery County and our firefighters, et cetera, did this year. So it was a great event as usual. Thanks to the chamber for putting it on. And uh, at that, I will say thank you. Thank you, Neil. We'll go to Council Member Sesma. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just wanted to echo the uh, remarks of my colleagues. I hope everybody did, did have the opportunity to enjoy the Labor Day holiday, but also at the same time observe uh, why we celebrate Labor Day and the importance of uh, the American worker in every setting in which um, Americans work and serve the public um, and uh, the labor movement as well. So um, the uh, Kentlands Lakelands 5K, which usually happens on this weekend, was a virtual event this year. It actually started on um, August 29th. You people were encouraged to register and then uh, run the race, run a 5K somewhere. Many people ran the, the usual course in the Kentlands and Lakelands. I did that on Saturday morning uh, at my uh, uh, very uh, relaxed pace. <laughs> Uh, and there were a number of people out there running as well. It was a great day to run. So I, I hope you did that. I think there's a, also, if you registered, you can post your time just to compare it to previous years. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna do that given my time, but I'll do that. And then uh, there's also a list of the uh, sponsors and donors in which you can make a separate uh, contribution. Uh, this is a, you know, this has always been a major event to uh, support a number of nonprofit partners with the, the Kentlands Community Foundation and the city of Gaithersburg. Uh, in fact, the city's uh, Dolores Sawyer uh, Scholarship Fund, which provides uh, 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 scholarships for uh, young people who want to participate in uh, city camps, uh, that's provided uh, that their, the Kent Community Foundation has been a major benefactor of that program. So. They will do that again this year. So, um, and then uh, COVID testing in the city is actually, I think, is tomorrow starts at nine o'clock and goes until one o'clock. Uh, so that's the only day this week that it's available. But again, check the website for more information. I know that our that a number of people, including our Senator Kagan, we got a note from her today that she's working on. Uh, a number of people are working on getting. Uh, more frequent testing at the uh, Lake Forest site. So I encourage you to get your flu shots, just like Neil said, um, whatever, however you do it, uh, whether you go to a pharmacy, super, uh, supermarket pharmacy, or regular pharmacy, uh, that's fine. And then uh, the two of our officers were honored at the uh, Gaithersburg Germantown Chamber Public Safety Awards, uh, Officer Dan Lane and Officer Mary Liddy were recognized uh, for their uh, activities. In particular, Officer Liddy was recognized for the uh, for, for putting her life at risk by making a rescue in the uh, lake in the pond at uh, in the lake at Rio uh, last summer, in which she saved uh, two people from drowning. So, a heroic act. And then Dan has been a great service to the community and was recognized for that. So, I want to. Congratulate both of those officers and uh, thank all of our officers and uh, uh, first responders for their efforts uh, throughout the year. Uh, they keep us safe and they're ready to help when we need it. So thanks very much. That's it for me tonight. Thank you, Mike. We'll go to Council Member Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I have nothing to add. Okay, Council Member Spiegel. Hard to follow that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll echo uh, all the other comments that have been made by my colleagues about the uh, great events and causes uh, that uh, we've all been working on and the virtual events that we've been attending. Uh, I want to do a shout out uh, to all of the city staff and volunteers who were involved in creating the video tribute for the Labor Day Parade. Obviously, we're all disappointed that we couldn't have the parade in person, but uh, if you haven't checked out the video tribute, it's available on our YouTube page and on our website. It's a really nice uh, video. Um, I also attended a, a number of events. I, uh, I was present for the virtual uh, Gaithersburg Germantown Chamber of Commerce Public Safety Awards and want to add my uh, thanks to our uh, two city officers who were recognized and to all of our public safety personnel. Um, I also attended um, a fundraiser uh, annual uh, fundraising event for the Victims' Rights Foundation, which is uh, a nonprofit organization very active in the region uh, to advocate uh, for victims of crime uh, and uh, for services uh, to support victims of crime. Uh, Greg Wims, uh, a good friend of the city 
uh, and a longtime activist, uh, leads that organization. I want to thank him for his work. It was a very nice event with some good speakers on August 26th. Um, and um, on August 28th, I was fortunate to be able to take my kids and attend uh, an in-person event, uh, safely social distancing to help our staff and volunteers at the Gaithersburg Cares Hub, uh, where uh, food and other supplies are collected for families in need during this difficult economy and difficult time when many people are unable to work uh, or unable to uh, leave their homes because they might be susceptible to the virus. Um, this incredible operation, it's a really well-oiled machine of dedicated volunteers and staff from our city's community services division and others uh, who come together to collect uh, donations every week and to disseminate those donations. Um, and so my kids and I were, I were able to drive around the city um, and make some uh, personal socially distanced uh, deliveries to families in need, uh, fresh food, uh, produce, uh, diapers for families with young kids. And it was really a sort of a special experience to be able to see the CARES Hub in operation and to be able to offer a little bit of help. Um, so I want to encourage folks to check out information about the CARES Hub on our city website. And if you're able to, to volunteer or to donate uh, supplies. Um, and if you need help to please reach out, uh, the information is available through our social media and through the website, or if you just call City Hall, uh, we are available to provide those supplies and assistance to families in need uh, as we are able. Um, a lot of families right now are dealing with the start of the virtual school year, the actual school year in, in remote fashion. Uh, my kids are now uh, back at virtual school and I know that many families are doing the best they can, struggling, challenged, uh, but uh, pulling it together to make this happen. And I wanna wish everybody the best of luck in the school year. And fingers crossed that as we slowly make progress, uh, there will be um, a light at the end of the tunnel uh, and we will be able to return safely uh, to our schools in person at some point. Um, but of course, uh, in order to protect our students, our teachers, uh, the uh, staff who work at schools, uh, the parents and others who come into contact with kids, um, we just really need to make sure that we stay safe. And so this seems to be the best option, the, the, the least bad option right now. Uh, and I just want to salute everybody who's really put it together to make it as good as possible uh, despite the limitations of virtual learning um, and wish everybody good luck in the school year. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, for any members of our community, uh, Jewish members of our community who observe uh, Rosh Hashanah as the Jewish New Year, which is coming up the end of next week, this will be our last formal meeting before Rosh Hashanah. I just want to wish all of those folks uh, a happy new year, a sweet new year. Uh, in Hebrew, we say Shana Tova. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so like Ryan, I, I had a chance to do some, spend some time um, volunteering at the CARES Hub this past Friday. Um, and I agree, it's a well-oiled machine. And I wanted to call everybody's attention to our website and the listing uh, for the CARES Hub has a, um, a full list of the items that are most needed. And it's, you know, these are things you don't have to go super out of your way to get, you know, if you're at the grocery store or at Costco or Sam's Club, um, it's, it wouldn't be hard to, to get a thing or two and, and drop it off uh, over at, uh, I think it's 13 First Field um, at the Seneca Creek Community Church where the CARES Hub is based. Um, and if you have time to volunteer, it's a very worthwhile experience. Um, this also calls to mind the fact that, um, you know, during the course of the year when it's a regular year and we can actually have meetings together, we do a lot of proclamations and honors and, and presentation type stuff that we have um, foregone for, for the time being because in, at some level it seems a little absurd to do some of that stuff when we're not in person. We don't have someone to present something to. Um, but there is a large and growing list of people in this community, not just Gaithersburg, but larger, uh, who we are going to look forward to honoring. Um, it, Mike Sesmo sent me, a, sent me a note the other day, which, you know, we had the same idea when we saw this news story about this young girl who, who saved uh, a toddler's life over at Strawberry Knowles Elementary. 
but you know, I was also talking to, to Maureen about uh, the person who works for MCPS who's coordinating uh, all of the food donations throughout the county at all of these sites, in several of, of which are, have been in Gaithersburg. Um, and there's the, you know, the, the, the people who are running the CARES Hub and there's just, you know, when times are tough and people step up, uh, they need, we need to thank them. They deserve recognition. And um, I certainly look for, I know all the council looks forward to the opportunity when we can uh, really get together and recognize everybody. So I just want to, just want to say we're, we're, we're compiling a list. Uh, this is a good list, good list. Um, and speaking of people who, who deserve uh, thanks, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Dennis Enslinger. And the reason being, this is his final regular meeting as acting city manager. Our new city manager, Tanisha Briley, starts next week. And um, I, I, I just wanted to, to congratulate and thank Dennis for doing uh, solid good work in an extremely difficult, unsettled time where, where uh, not only are forces from the outside looking for support and services and leadership from the city, but, but our staff from the inside uh, is, is looking for leadership and direction on questions in this, in this entirely unprecedented, strange time. Uh, and it just so happened that uh, Tony Tomasello, our, our former city manager, had had already planned to retire. It just happened in the middle of, of this crisis and, and Dennis stepped up and has, has been very nice for, for all of us to work with. And, um, and so I wanted to, to give him thanks and, and maybe we can give him a, a, a quick little round of applause here, uh, council members. And with that said, um, We'll, we'll, we're going to get to you in a sec, Dennis. So let me just do my, my quick announcement of upcoming meetings. Next week, uh, we have our, a work session to receive a presentation from our racial equity cohort. Um, it will be a presentation of initial data collection, police department statistics, procurement vendor information, and uh, preliminary research on street and building names. Um, Again, this, this session, like all, all the others of recent times, will be on Zoom um, Monday, September, 20, uh, September 14th, 7.30 p.m. Uh, well, you can catch us on, on YouTube, and if you'd like to participate, as always, um, go to gaithersburgmd.gov slash virtual, and the next regular session of the Mayor and Council will be on Monday, September 21st, and we will go to from the acting city manager. Thanks, Judd, and thanks, Mayor and Council, for those um, great words and appreciation. I also was going to kind of indicate that, you know, I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, the experience over the last four months, and to be honest, I've gained a wealth of knowledge. Some of that I never thought I would need to gain about COVID and other things related to that. Um, but also just to express my thanks for the opportunity and that I look forward to continuing my service uh, to the city and the residents in the years to come as the deputy city manager um, in my past position and actually current position in some ways. Um, I'll look forward to that. Um, I did have kind of two items for the public and for the council. Again, as noted earlier, this is I think only the second time in the history of Gaithersburg that we have not held the Labor Day Parade. Uh, one of the items that we typically um, hand out or toss out from the mayor and council trolley is the commemorative coins. Uh, those are available should residents want those. Uh, you can find information in the video tribute posted on the city's website on how to obtain those. In addition, I wanted to just remind the public that because of COVID and the limited kind of recreational opportunities, uh, that everyone has. Uh, the water park will be open past the traditional Labor Day closure. Uh, the water park will be open with limited hours of operation for uh, lap swimming Monday through Thursday and then on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for open swim through September 20th. Um, I think the weather might be a little chilly on some of those days, but it does give everybody the opportunity uh, for another recreation aspect within our community. In addition, we have extended the miniature golf course um, hours and the season for that. So you can find more information about those two facilities at the 
Gaithersburg website, gaithersburgmd.gov. That's all I have for this evening. Thank you, Dennis. Um, next, if we can bring Texi, you've already brought on Tom Lonergan. Excellent. Good work. Economic development update. Go ahead, Tom. It's like they knew I was coming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, members of the council. Just one item tonight. I just wanted to provide you with a quick update on the status of the city's hotel market. Uh, the most recent information I have to share is the July data, which indicated that while we're up from early pandemic lows, uh, the city's uh, hotel industry and frankly the hotel industry uh, well beyond our borders continues to struggle. The average occupancy at the city's 12 hotel properties stood at 33.7% for the month of July, roughly in line with June's average. Uh, that's certainly better than the 25% occupancy rate recorded in April, but ominously lower than the 75% rate recorded just a year ago. The average daily room rate crept up to around $91 per night, down from the 113 average recorded a year ago, but up from the $77 rate recorded in May. The only city hotel property that has not reopened for business is the Holiday Inn, which we do not believe will be reopening at all. Hotel motel tax collections had been rising until the pandemic struck, but the drop in room nights and room rates has translated into significantly lower revenues since March. What's the good news, if any? Well, the city continues to outperform most of the county's submarkets, including Silver Spring and even Bethesda, where average occupancy has remained below 20% since the onset of COVID. Our relative strength with the hotel market is attributed, at least in part, to the city's biotechnology sector, which never shut down during the pandemic and continued to bring workers and other business travelers to Gaithersburg. And while occupancy is not expected to return to pre-COVID averages at our hotels until early next year, we are at least encouraged by the uptick in traffic and rates. Uh, economic development staff will continue to monitor the market and we wanna thank our friends at Visit Montgomery for all their assistance with helping to gather this information and for their work marketing our hotel properties throughout this crisis. That's all I've got. Thank you, Tom. Um, appreciate it. So a tech team, if we can, we're going to move on to ordinances, resolutions, and regulations and uh, call up McNeil Brown uh, and anybody else here to uh, speak about the Arts Barn Energy Upgrade. Tony, welcome. Good evening. Um, Good. Hi. Go right ahead, guys. Well, welcome, Ron McNeil. Hi. Good, uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. My name is McNeil Brown. I'm a Capital Projects Program Manager with the Department of Public Works. Pursuant to Resolution R-22-19 on July the 2nd, 2019, the city entered into a contract with Fresh Air Concepts, LLC, for the upgrade of the HVAC system at the Arts Barn. Construction began in late summer 2019 with the work that included replacing the building's boiler, the cooling tower, the water sourced heat pumps, and included the installation of an energy management system. As the system was commissioned, the Arts Barn staff noticed unacceptable noise levels emanating from some of the water source heat pumps. Capital Project staff and the Arts Barn staff worked with the contractor to formulate solutions that resolved the noise issues. The change orders that are being presented here tonight uh, were, were completed by the contractor to address the noise, improve the user friendliness of the system, and eliminate work that was no longer needed under the contract. Staff is requesting a con a, that the contract be amended from its original amount of $656,286 and increased to $698,923 dollars to cover change orders 001 through 006. The $42,637 increase represents a 6.5% increase to the original contract amount. The architect and the engineer of record have both reviewed the change orders, and funding for these change orders is available from the contingency account. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, McNeil. Uh, questions, comments? Just raise your hand, council members. If, unless someone is ready to move the resolution. Mike, go ahead. And then Neil. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm glad to see that we're moving on this because I, I, 
the staff at the Arts Barn did comment that uh, even though the system was improved in terms of climate control, uh, it, it did seem to be a lot noisier. So I'm glad that we're looking at the design again and hopefully making the corrections that needed to be made. I am wondering whether there was a problem in the overall design that resulted in, in the noise that we, we have and whether because of that uh, uh, perhaps uh, design oversights, uh, we may ask for a little bit more back from the, uh, uh, on this contract. Can you fill us in on that? Uh, absolutely, Mr. Uh, Council Member. Um, I, we, did, we have engaged with the uh, design team on some errors and omissions that we have, we have uh, found um, we are uh, going to continue to engage with them along those lines, um, and they've, we, we've issued formal letters to them, so they're aware of um, some of their shortcomings, and we are um, attempting to both address these matters quickly for the Arts Barn staff so that they can continue their mission, as well as go back and, and make the city whole. Great, thank you. Glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. Neil, go ahead. Yeah, on the basis that we're going to go back and try to get things made right for the city, I'd like to move the resolution. Okay, before, before we go to, did you second it, Mike? Yes, I just seconded. Okay. Before we go to the vote, I, I saw Lorianne's Laurie hand up. Did you want to say anything, Lorianne? No, I, I just had a question about the uh, subtraction of the Louvre credit and wanted to know what that was in relation to. Sure. The Louvre was originally a part of the design of this project. Uh, but however, we actually did replace that louver when we replaced the roof for the arts barn. So we did not need, need it in this project. So that's why we, we asked for the credit. Okay. And is there going to be a, a different, I guess, uh, review of the work throughout the process? Because it looks like some things may have been missed in the original uh, proposal for the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the change orders are addressing those matters. Um, some of, effectively what, ha what we have was some of the um, ductwork needed to be um, upgraded as well, and it wasn't included in the original design. Okay, all right. That's fine. That's oh. all. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and a second, and I'm gonna call the, call the roll. Everyone who's in favor, please say aye. Any opposed say nay. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Sesma. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Council Member Spiegel? Aye. Council Member Sales? Aye. Okay, carries unanimously. Next, Thank we you. have um, Michael Wand, and um, we are going to talk about our cooperative agreement with Chesapeake Bay Trust. Tech team, if you could bring up all involved with that topic. Hello. Oh, Michael. Good evening. This is a resolution of the Mayor and City Council authorizing the acting city manager to execute a five year renewal of the cooperative agreement with the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Their acronym is CBT. The agreement would allow CBT to administer the city's stormwater outreach and restoration grant program. Since 2016, the partnership has awarded over 263,000 in funding to support community driven stormwater projects. These projects include conservation landscaping, green roofs, watershed workshops, and green team leadership development with an emphasis on creating neighborhood solutions for improved water quality. The upcoming FY21 grant cycle is a record-breaking year. We've received six new grant applications with the possibility of awarding slightly over 146,000 in grant money. Under the current partnership agreement, city staff can endorse and evaluate grant projects by participating in the CBT's technical review committee. Um, the initial agreement period was July 1, 2015 through June 30, 2022. Uh, to, up, to fund the upcoming FY21 grant cycle, staff is requesting that Marin City Council authorize the acting city manager to execute Section 3 terms of renewal of the original contract that would extend the agreement for additional five years. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to try to answer uh, any questions that you have. Thank you, Michael. Um, questions or comments, council members? Not would someone like to move the resolution? Neil, saw your hand first. Yeah, it seems like a great program. Very happy to move the resolution. Okay, Ryan, I saw your hand second. I agree, I'm happy to second. Okay, I'll call the roll. All in favor say aye, any opposed say nay. Council Member Harris? Aye. Council Member Sesma? Aye. Council Member Wu? Aye. 
Council Member Spiegel. Aye. And Council Member Sales. Aye. All right, carries unanimously. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Next, tech team, if you can bring up Beth Forbes and um, anyone in, else involved in the contract for stormwater management facility inspections. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can, we can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, that's fine with me. Okay. Um, the city's National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit issued by the Maryland Department of Environment requires the city to inspect all the stormwater management facilities within its boundaries every three years, and each must be inspected by the end of the permit term of October 30th, 2023. Charles P. Johnson and Associates Incorporated is currently providing such stormwater management facility inspections for Howard County, pursuant to a contract entered in 2019 and the contractor is willing to extend the same contract pricing to the city. On that basis, the stormwater program of the Department of Public Works recommends that the city enter into a three-year contract for stormwater management facility inspections with CPJ based on the Howard County contract pricing. Staff believe that the results of the Howard County purchasing processes for contracts are substantially similar or superior to the results the city would have obtained if we had done a formal solicitation for the same amount of effort. And said processes meet the city's definition of a formal solicitation. Staff therefore recommend the award of the contract to Charles P. Johnson and Associates Incorporated in the amount not to exceed $485,000 over its three year term ending October 30th, 2023. The funding is from the Stormwater Management Fund. Uh, we feel that timely inspections are important because if we don't have all our facilities inspected, MDE might deny us credits from existing facilities towards our MPDES goals. Failure of the facilities is also a possibility if, they're, if maintenance items go uncorrected. The ability to use a contract for the inspections has several benefits. One, we only have one inspector, so uh, this should be able to help her make sure that they all get done. And if we find a lot of uh, repair things, she might be spending a lot of her time doing follow-up inspection. We have some facilities that are very rare within the city and we can use uh, CPJ's um, experience in inspecting and finding any issues with those. And there's also some opportunities for specialized services. Beth, are you still still with us? I'm, I'm still here. Okay, w were you done? I'm done. Okay, great. Uh, Neil Harris, go ahead. So a quick question for you, Beth. Um, thanks for the update. Um, you know, when we set up the uh, stormwater fund initially, was the amount that we expected to spend on inspection services comparable to what the, this proposal is? I don't have the answer to that offhand. I know we are working on a stormwater program fee update right now, and that's something we're looking at. Any other questions or comments, council members? If not, uh, would someone like to move the resolution? Ryan, please. Yeah, I just had a quick comment. I mean, I think I, we need to underscore the point uh, that was made um, that uh, these inspections are necessary uh, sufficiently, doing these inspections is necessary to ensure that we get the credits under our permit for work either already done or being done. Otherwise, we really risk a significant loss in terms of the investment uh, that we've been making and are making uh, in order to ensure compliance. I mean, a lot of effort has been expended already and is, is, is ongoing, and it would just be kind of a waste if all of that wasn't credited uh, toward our obligations under the federal and state uh, unfunded mandates imposed upon us uh, for stormwater management. So um, I think it's important that we do this. I think Neil raises a good question, and it would be nice if we had that answered tonight. But even without it, it's, it's pretty clear that this is an investment worth making to ensure that the significant work we've done is credited uh, at the highest level that it can be credited at uh, for purposes of meeting those state and federal requirements. So with that, I'd be happy to uh, move the resolution. Second. 
Okay, we have a second. So I'm going to call the roll. All in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Sesma. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. And Council Member Sales. Was it, that was an aye, right, Norian? Yes, aye. Oh, got it. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, thank you, Beth. Next, uh, we have staff guidance, um, and we're going to talk about the County of Subdivision staging policy. Um, and tech team, if you could bring up Jess Kwasny, Kirk Eby, and Rob Robinson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. How are you? <laughs> Great. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Jess Kwasney, the Legislative Affairs Manager for the City of Gaithersburg, and I hope everyone had a restful holiday weekend. During um, your August 24th work session, the Mayor and City Council received a presentation on the Montgomery County Planning Board's draft subdivision staging policy, and I'll refer to that as the SSP moving forward. At the conclusion of the work session, Mayor Ashman and the City Council voiced their desire to submit comments on the SSP to County Council prior to their meeting on September 15th. Um, that is when they're having their public hearing. It's at 730 on the 15th. In order to assist in this effort, Rob Robinson and Kirk Ebby prepared a memorandum which seeks to answer questions raised by the Mayor and the City Council and provides several recommendations to consider, including um, comments to the um to help um develop comments to the city um for the city and put forth to the county council the memorandum can be found on packet page 55 in the agenda packet just quickly as a background for any guests joining the meeting that were not attending the work session um montgomery county is updating its subdivision staging policy for the years 2020 through 2024 the SSP includes the Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance, APFO, tests for schools and transportation um, that are applicable to development projects in the county. These county APFO requirements are not applicable within the city as the city has its own Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance tests and requirements and methodologies. However, the county's SSP does include recommendations regarding impact taxes and recordation fees which will apply within the city. The county's test is updated every four years and the last update occurred in 2016. This update primarily focuses on the schools portion of the APFO and it did focus more on transportation in 2016. Um, I would like to note that staff participated through the county um, planning staff's efforts for the 2020 SSP, both Rob and Kirk are available on our on our meeting tonight to provide additional information that you may need um, as I summarize the staff recommendations. So the first recommendation for transportation. As you heard last week, the 2020 SSP retains the transportation changes enacted in 2016 and adds two primary tasks. The SSP outlines 19 recommendations to achieve these tasks. Um, and the mayor and city council requested additional information on 5.6 and 5.8. So for 5.6, the staff advises the council not to object to the elimination of the red policy area recommendations as they are not applicable to the city. As far as 5.8, um, staff recommends that the council not object to the increased intersection delay standards for the transit corridors outside of the city. The other proposed SSP recommendations are focused on how Montgomery County planning implements their various internal development reviews and therefore does not require um, or warrant council comment. However, staff does note that the county's efforts to better incorporate Vision Zero and the overall safety for all modes of travel and therefore should recommend in their public comments that the city council and mayor will submit that the use of the transportation impact review be expanded to include infrastructure, improvements related to safety, such as a pedestrian countdown timer and not limited to increasing mode capacity. So that's the first part. I don't know, would you like me to read through all of the recommendations and then ask questions or, or questions if you have any as we go through each portion? Uh, it looks, Neil just raised his hand. I'm assuming he has an opinion on this. Go ahead. So I'm wondering why the staff did not make any recommendations regarding the red areas because the red areas are the areas where 
the county is uh, looking to pr promote development and economic development and they're all down county. There's nothing up in this area. And the, the rationale for that is that they're all focused primarily around metro stations or transit facilities, but there's no emphasis on transit facilities beyond the end of the metro. Um, I'm not sure that that's in the city's best interest. And while it doesn't affect our ability to make zoning and development decisions, it does affect the incentives or disincentives that are being applied in other zones. So does staff have any strong opinions on that one way or another? Yes, if I may weigh in and sort of expand upon what was in the memo. In fact, the red policy areas, while they are associated with metro stations, are smaller in geographic scope. And as I mentioned in the memo, their typology is extremely urban. The issue, the ways in the county develop the red policy areas is, unlike suburban development, which you find in Gaithersburg and other areas of the county, um, they physically can't add capacity. You're not going to remove 20-story um, buildings in Bethesda in order to add another lane. So really, their policy areas are, are developed in such a way to take base fees. So using the local area transportation review, they do not do that for the red policy areas. They just take a cash subsidy. So that's why, again, they're really not smaller. It was not designed to um, encourage investment. There's already investment in Bethesda and, and, and Silver Spring. It's really dealing with the, the physical morphology of how development has occurred. So that's why, again, from staff's perspective, it's really not applicable here in the city because we don't have that dense urbanity. Um, I think the only intersection that, that we have that really precludes any additional capacity is 124 at Maryland 355. Otherwise, outside of that, um, we have abilities to, to address adding capacity vehicularly. So th that, it's a subtle difference, but that was really where staff's perspective was coming along from the red policy areas. Rob Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. Um, just two quick questions, one regarding um, the recommendations to council on the, uh, the increased section, intersection delay. Is that truly something that is, is not impactful to the city or how does, how does that relate to, for example, the county controls intersection lights in the city and the county owns road infrastructure in the city? Do those intersections, uh, are, are those under our purview as far as um, planning recommendations that would fall under the section or is there in fact county interplay within the city's borders? I guess I'll take that one. Um, as it relates, uh, again, intersections, well, this is only related to transit corridors. So again, one of the things to make note is our transit corridors are centered along state roads. Um, while the county owns and maintains signalization um, along the, the, the state roads, you know, they don't in fact control them. So it's based upon the study. And again, from my concern is the actual delay. Again, we use a CLV standard. We don't use a delay standard here within the city. So our development in the city, you know, abides by that. Um, as I mentioned, you know, staff sort of, again, sort of really doesn't have a concern about the delay because essentially the delay per vehicle is only going from a minute to a minute and a half. And most people, even behind the wheel, really don't recognize 30 seconds. And, and we think the benefits along the transit corridors outweighs the 30 second delay per vehicle. Okay, so what I'm hearing is, is that that portion does not, in fact, apply in the city. None of, none of the recommendations apply within the city. That, again, the only thing in the subdivision staging policy that was presented to council that applies to the city is the impact taxes and the recordation taxes. Every other aspect does not apply to the city of Gaithersburg. Okay, and so my second question is, is on that second point, the, recommend, the, the uh, recordation tax. And so the progressive nature of the, the proposal um, put some of the funding into the county's housing initiative fund. Is that applicable in the city? Because um, I know we do have our own fund. Do, does the county's fund also apply here in the city as well? That I am not aware of. I, I know, again, you are correct. We have our own housing initiatives fund. I know there's a county fund. Um, we do, I, I, Dennis may be able to answer that, but, but Louise is not here, so I am not quite sure. I think Again, if council wishes to issue comments, one of the comments could, that could be made, um, much as we had worked with um, the county and the planning board to make sure you know, our affordable housing program was recognized, that could be a comment 
that, you know, uh, recordation taxes or sort of how we handle the traffic impact taxes, um, that recordation taxes here, you know, create some MOU um, that at that level would go into our, our housing initiative fund rather than the county housing initiative fund. Okay, yeah. my concern would be, you know, for example, with the, the impact taxes, we talked about last time about the nexus to the projects here in the city. But if uh, the um, recordation tax at the certain level, we're providing funding into the county's housing initiative fund where our taxpayers are paying into it, if they met that housing threshold, the price threshold, but we're not, uh, th there wouldn't be no benefit to our community, I, I, would, I would have concern about supporting it. Um, just to follow up on Rob's comment, um, to my knowledge, we do not have an MOU that would address the recordation fund. We do have an MOU with the county regarding the transportation development tax portions mm -hmm. that we have been negotiating back and forth with over the last few years of how those funds could be used uh, within Gaithersburg. Their current ordinance on those provisions indicate that the transportation development tax must be used um, in the city of Gaithersburg. I don't believe under the proposed um, subdivision regulations that's included in that. But then again, you, you also have to realize that you would probably want to make that comment because there will be additional uh, legislative matters related to the implementation of the subdivision um, recommendations from the planning board of Montgomery County. Thanks, Dennis. So, so for my, if this is staff guidance, my druthers on that would be you know, the recordation tax was recently increased, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of lukewarm as to making, having the city make a recommendation in support of another tax increase for recordation. But regardless of, of that point, you know, to the extent our, city, our residents are being taxed on a certain issue, I think we should ensure or advocate for some kind of nexus of benefit back here to the city. So comments could be drafted. When we draft the comments, we can um, include in those comments that and come up with language outlining the concern and suggesting that an MOU be entered into. And then once the county council has a discussion and public comment on the 15th, it does go back to the county council's transportation committee. And so there will be time to make amendments and some changes and additions to the policy plan um, if necessary. Um, and they, and again, like I've said, they've included Rob and many and most of the discussions. So that can definitely get on their radar. Uh, I saw Ryan's hand up and now I see Mike's too. Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, I wasn't sure if we were sort of done with the complete presentation by staff because we sort of jumped from transportation to uh, impact taxes uh, uh, and, and recordation taxes. So I don't know if there was I agree, Ryan. Let, I'm going to come right back to you, but Jess, can you just summarize all the recommendations real quickly, and then we'll come back sure. to questions. Sure. Um, so that was the, those were the recommendations for the transportation section. We'll move to the county um, recommendations. Again, the 2020 FSP for schools includes amendments to ensure school capacity adequacy within the county's current growth paradigm and facilitate multiple county housing policy goals. The SSP proposes three primary actions to reflect the new approach. Um, and then within that approach, they outline 16 recommendations to achieve this task. However, the mayor and city council requested additional information for 4.1, 4.4, and 4.5. So for 4.1, staff recommends that the council support the impact areas, specifically those designations within the city as they reflect established city designations. Staff recommends that the council support recommendations 4.4 and 4.5 regarding individual school tests with three-year utilization. Further, staff recommends that the council support ending development, tor development moratoriums and establishing the utilization premium payments. And then um, the final section that we've jumped to is the county school funding and impact taxes. And so in the chapter six of the SSP, it outlines educational funding sources and the county's impact tax, which um, are applicable to development in the city. Um, the SSP outlines different calculations and factors that go into this. Um, and staff was asked to provide analysis on whether the impact tax was the best method to fund school capacity, and does it create a negative impact on home costs? The memo does provide more detail, but in short, 
staff does not believe that it does. Therefore, staff recommends that the council support the proposed imp impact tax rate and the implementation and ask the book and how it's applied in the city. Staff recommends that the council support the proposed designated growth areas and reduce impact tax rates and the implementation. Further, we recommend that the council support the vesting of the impact tax benefits of designated enterprise and opportunity zones as they exist today over the course of the SSP implementation period from 2020 to 2024, even if these programs are discontinued by the state or federal government during the period. And then finally, staff recommends that the council not object to the proposed recordation tax increase. And so at that, um, no, we'll go back and this is the staff guidance um, and just need guidance from the mayor and city council on what comments should look like and what should be included for our comments to submit. They will have to be submitted on Friday to be um, ready for the county council to hear them on September 15th. Okay, we're going to Ryan and then Mike and then Neil. Ryan, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I'll just try to sort of run through my thoughts uh, just quickly on the transportation piece of the SSP. Um, like I think Neil, I continue to have a little bit of queasiness about um, not objecting at all. Um, I understand the position that, you know, uh, these uh, transportation uh, capacity tests do not apply within the city and therefore we shouldn't really get into a, a battle that doesn't really directly affect the city. But all of this stuff affects the city, whether directly or indirectly, as we are situated in the middle of the county. And uh, so I think we need to think a little bit more broadly about uh, what these uh, elements mean uh, for the way that they might impact the city. To, to Neil's point about uh, red policy areas and, and whether we wanna kind of, even if it's in a gentle and diplomatic way, um, consider what our position will be with respect to ensuring that uh, economic development is uh, fairly um, steered toward the mid county and uh, there are proper incentives there and that the down county sort of doesn't become this sort of big vacuum sucking away opportunity. Obviously, the down county has uh, a lot of um, inherent uh, infrastructure uh, and other things that, uh, that the mid county just doesn't have. Um, but I think we should be a little bit more sort of thoughtful in how we um, take a position on uh, some of these broader questions. And I had asked uh, during the last session where we talked about this, about 5.8. Um, and it, again, that's one that just makes me a little uneasy because basically the county is saying uh, we're prepared to allow more traffic congestion uh, in areas where we're planning uh, transit corridors. And, you know, that's another one where, you know, we have to be a little bit careful about putting the cart before the horse. Uh, if we don't have the transit yet in certain places, but we're planning for it in certain places, how much additional congestion is it really appropriate for us to tolerate um, as, as we proceed? And even if those intersections that are subject to that uh, uh, more lax test or more strict test, depending on how you look at it. Um, even if they're technically outside the city, you know, our residents and our business owners and the people who come to our city to spend money here and support our economy are still going to have to drive through many of those other intersections nearby. And so I think we, we just ought to just be a little bit careful. I don't think we want to dive headfirst into these debates about tests that don't necessarily apply in our city, but we may want to, we may want to weigh in a little bit on those issues. Uh, in a careful way. Um, in terms of the recommendation to expand the use of the impact tax funds, I think that makes perfect sense. Any more leeway and flexibility that we have to use the funds that are set aside for the city um, makes sense. And uh, the staff recommendation sort of raises the point that uh, some of the things that we might do for safety uh, infrastructure improvements may, in a way, kind of support um, additional use of other modes, namely uh, walking, <laughs> biking, and other things that might uh, be uh, more appealing if intersections and, and infrastructure is, is safer. Um, so we might be able to make that connection as well, but I think that's kind of a no-brainer uh, in terms of a recommendation. Um, moving on to the school 
SSP. I think 4.4 and 4.5 are also no brainers. Those are the ones that uh, talk about looking at the school's test with respect to individual schools only, something that the city of Gaithersburg has been doing with its APFO for many years. And the county is sort of catching up to us on that. Um, and um, utilizing uh, projections three years out instead of five or six years out also makes sense to me, of course, it still raises the question of how accurate our projections are. But um, I think it's better to look at three years out than it is to look at five or six years out. Um, so 4.4 and 4.5 seem, seem like no brainers to me. Um, and then in terms of funding and impact taxes, I don't, I don't think we necessarily want to wade into the question of whether we uh, su support or oppose the recordation tax so much as we sort of accept it as a reality and we don't necessarily need to object to it. Um, but I agree with council member Wu uh, that we ought to see if there's a path forward uh, to ensure a nexus between the collection of those uh, tax revenues and uh, services that are actually available to city residents and support our city as we do with other MOUs. So I would encourage staff to figure out, a, again, a, a diplomatic way to maybe bring that up, especially since Dennis pointed out that this kind of sets the stage for uh, future legislative and regulatory discussions at the county level. And we want to kind of plant the seed with them as early as possible in the process uh, that uh, we would, you know, we would be advocating for that kind of a nexus uh, to ensure that our residents are getting the same benefits that other residents around the county are getting. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's this uh, new utilization fee, uh, which kind of reminds me a lot of the school facility fee that used to exist, which is technically not a tax. And although this is not something that I think necessarily needs to go into our recommendations to the county, um, as I mentioned at our last meeting about this, I, I do think we need to seriously look at updating our own uh, regulations that we adopted some years ago that have been sort of dormant ever since the county facility fee was removed. Those regulations can now be brought back to life uh, if we can create our own comparable utilization premium uh, payment system that matches the counties and then uh, proceed with an MOU with the county uh, to have uh, that, those, those funds collected within the city uh, hopefully be used uh, uh, to the benefit of the city and the schools within our area. Um, so I'm not sure that's something that necessarily needs to be mentioned in our recommendations uh, to the county, but I think it's something that needs to sort of be thought of and go hand in hand with the recommendations that we're making so that we can move forward on that expeditiously when the time comes. Um, so those are, those are my main thoughts in terms of guidance. Okay, thanks Ryan, we'll go to Mike. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll endorse uh, the specific remarks that Ryan just made and I'm also in agreement with uh, Rob that uh, 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 with regard to the recordation tax and other fees that we're talking about here is that uh, the benefits of, uh, of those I don't know what you call them benefits, <laughs> but the revenue generated by those fees and taxes should be should accrue to the to the residents of the city, especially those who are paying them as well. Uh, we have as many needs in terms of housing and transportation as any other part of the county. So if if those fees are being collected on properties within the city, then those should uh, be reflected within the within the city boundaries as well and applied there to address uh, those needs that, that uh, go along with the staging plan. I, I, uh, I'm, one of the things that I'm most excited about here, or I don't know, excited or enthusiastic about is the, the adoption by the staging plan to uh, look at school capacity on a school by school basis. I think that's very important. I've been talking about that for years and, and, and clearly that's the right way to do it. The problem is we're still going to be stuck with uh, the projections of MCPS, which are uh, consistently conservative and off the mark by about five percent on an annual basis. So if we're looking uh, if we're looking at this over a shorter period of time, then I think we'll be have a better idea of what the actual needs are. So uh, that's about it. I just think that whatever fees and taxes are going to be imposed, whether we uh, recommend. Uh, uh, our support or not, uh, I think they should accrue to the city as much as possible so that we can 
those can be applied to address the needs within the city uh, rather than uh, the, the residents and uh, property. People buying property within the city or changing property uh, are not subsidizing uh, projects in another part of the county where we have needs as well. So that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Go ahead, Neil. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to be an outlier on a lot of these points, so be prepared. Um, starting with the, the, the least objectionable, but I think objectionable piece of the intersection delay standard being increased. We have among the worst traffic congestion of automobile traffic in the country today, um, projected to get worse. And it strikes me that this policy change is designed to go along with a longstanding but unofficial policy of making automobile traffic congestion worse and therefore providing a perverse incentive for people to get out of their cars and into transit. And while getting people out of their cars and into transit is a laudable goal, um, increasing misery in order to accomplish that does not strike me as being the uh, appropriate methodology. And uh, half a minute per intersection doesn't seem terrible, but it's a big county and there's a lot of intersections and this could really add up significantly. So uh, I have a, some, some heartburn with that. And like I said, that's the least of my worries. So you can imagine what I'm gonna say on, the other, on a couple of the other points. Um, so the staff's opinion is that, the, uh, that there's no objection to impact taxes being used to fund uh, increases in the CIP for school construction. And I think increasing school construction is clearly an important priority for this, for this region. Um, however, it's hard for me to imagine that the size of the impact taxes on new residents construction uh, does not have an Im impact on the other critical issue, which is the lack of affordable housing in this region. When you're, when you're increasing the cost of a house or an apartment by tens of thousands of dollars, by many tens of thousands of dollars, uh, that, that's an issue. And they're, you know, directing, saying that, that the increase has to be funded by individual new developments when we already know that most of the uh, increase in utilization of the schools uh, is coming from others from from uh, sales of other existing homes. I think that's a bit of an issue, uh, and I think there are other approaches that should be taken. I think it's the county's issue more than ours, but I'd like to raise my voice and say that we should look at it uh, different ways to do it. And then the third point is on the recordation tax. I'm really having some heartburn because I crunch the numbers. They there are a number of, of tweaks to the recordation taxes, but plugging them into my friend Microsoft Excel, it looks like about a 25% increase in the recordation taxes. So, uh, and it's, it's progressive, which means it gets bigger with bigger size properties. It is uh, applicable to commercial as well as residential and those numbers really get high. So you're talk, talking about if I sold my home under this new regime, I'd be paying a, several thousand dollars, I think $2,800 more in recordation taxes than I'm paying today. Uh, I think that's a very significant and kind of stealthy tax increase. Um, and I understand that to some extent it's offset by the fact that the uh, impact taxes have been decreased a little bit. Um, and that's great, but I would think that in, if, in the normal state of affairs, the general consensus of the populace, I believe, in this county is that taxes are already on a little on the high side. But in the case of the current economy with COVID impacting everything very negatively, I don't think this is the time for that sort of thing. I understand that the county is trying to figure out where uh, money comes from to do important things. But this just doesn't seem like to me like the time for you know a 25% increase on any tax is a big bite. So I think that that point ought to be made clear to the county council, whether it's by the city or by the individual taxpayers. But I think that it should be understood that this is not a small bite, this is a big bite. All right, I'm climbing off my soapbox now. It's just somebody else's turn. Okay, thank you, Neil. Um, Lorianne, we haven't heard from you. I don't, I don't wanna put you on the spot if you don't wanna add anything, but I wanna give you a chance if you do. No, thank you, Mayor. Um, so thank you, Jess, uh, 
Rob for the presentation. Um, not too much more to add. Um, I appreciate the uh, support for the um, transportation um, recommendation for the county's inclusion of uh, um, not just uh, increasing, not focusing just on increasing capacity, but also on safety. Um, I did have questions about the recordation tax, but I've heard quite a few points um, outlined here. Um, and I tend to agree with Neil about being in the midst of a pandemic and um, uh, recommending a uh, tax increase at this time. Um, I think all of our jurisdictions are looking at um, new ways to uh, new ways to increase revenue uh, during this time. Um, and so uh, the other point, um, since uh, we are looking at what the county um, is recommending for, um, I know that their capacity is lower than ours and I don't know, um, I know Ryan mentioned we should revisit uh, our APFO uh, discussion, it's been a while. And I don't know if anyone else had any thoughts about making changes here with regards to our capacity. I know that we're higher than the county and just wanted to know if we uh, had any recommendations about mirroring the county's capacity and with regards to the 150% over capacity versus the counties. I know that uh, the city of Rockville is also lower. Um, and so those were the only points that I, uh, had to make. Thanks, Lorian. The um, I'm not sure that the county. First off, the county hasn't adopted anything yet, and so it may make sense for us to wait and see what the county does here, and then see if we want to mirror it, or if we want to just um, make changes or revisit our APFO. Um, I certainly would be amenable to having that discussion and and bringing it up and revisiting. I think it's a healthy thing to revisit it. Um, I'm not sure Rockville's is a, is a really apples to apples comparison because there are some things they do different, you know, look at differently and evaluate differently from the way we do. But I think it's a fair conversation. So I heard, I heard Neil with the opposition to the idea of the raised recordation tax, and I heard Lorianne there too. Um, Council member, is there anybody else who's on board with, with that particular point? I wanna make sure, I'm gonna be giving this testimony next week. Jess is gonna be helping write this testimony. I wanna make sure we represent the council accurately. And even if, even if we, it, it's a three, two on that point, I still think Jess could write it in such a way that there is, you know, the council supports this, although there is concern about uh, a raise in the tax at this at this point in time. Ryan, I see you want to speak and then we'll go to Rob. Is the uh, recordation tax the one that's the uh, progressive graduated tax scale that we talked about last time? It is. Yeah, so I mean, there could be tweaks in terms, in my view, in terms of, you know, what where the brackets stop and start. And as long as the lower brackets are either mostly the same as what they have been, or at least uh, only a modest increase. I mean, that may be tolerable. I understand the point about being sensitive in the midst of this time. I mean, this is all, all these documents are recommendations sort of teed up for the county to act in the very long term. Um, it will take time for this to make its way through the bureaucratic processes in the county. Um, and ultimately the city, you know, doesn't control uh, what those tax rates are gonna be, but of course we can advocate. Um, this may just be anecdotal, but it seems to me from what I'm reading and what I'm seeing and hearing at the much higher end of the market, things are on fire right now. I mean, for whatever bizarro reason in the midst of this pandemic and this economic downturn, higher end real estate is, uh, at least residential real estate, 
is selling like hotcakes right now. And in Montgomery County, in a place that already has, you know, perhaps not the most competitive tax structure. And to me, that says there's room, uh, there's slack in the system uh, where people are going to be willing to pay a little bit more um, to get uh, those, those luxury level uh, residential properties and be able to contribute more to the pot that will help uh, create capacity in our school system. So because of the fact that it's graduated and progressive and hopefully um, designed to generate more of that revenue from the higher end, um, you know, that's something that I can, I can get on board with. Although I, I certainly understand and sympathize with the arguments that we want to be cautious about anything that's going to be considered a, a tax increase or an additional burden on working families. If the burden isn't too bad uh, on people on the lower end of that scale, and the benefits are significant in terms of the resources that we need in this county for school capacity and school investment, um, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily ready to uh, fight against it. So um, that's kind of where I stand on that. Um, I did also, since I've got the mic for a moment, I did just want to mention, I think staff's recommendation regarding uh, enterprise and opportunity zones also makes sense since we have some of those zones within the city, we might as well uh, take as much advantage of their existence um, within the city. And I guess my understanding is that staff's recommendation is that we um, uh, advocate for uh, the benefits, uh, the impact tax benefits to be vested in those areas as they exist today. And I guess the recommendation from the, the SSP was, uh, the draft SSP was to, uh, was that if a zone is faded out, then the benefit from that area also gets faded out. And I guess the, uh, our staff is recommending against that, uh, that fading out. And I think for the benefit of our city and the incentives to create in those zones within our city, um, staff's recommendation makes sense. All right, go to Rob Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I think before, um, when, when I kind of jumped the line, I apologize for jumping ahead of the presentation. I characterized my um, view towards the recordation tax as being lukewarm, um, given that there was just recently an increase in the recordation tax. Um, I think that would be the sentiment I would want to convey um, to the county. The, the problem I've got with the city taking an official objection on a county tax is, is that you know it, it's it's outside of our jurisdiction. Now, obviously, the tax will impact our residents, um, but that I think is up for individual residents to make their voices heard. So I would say if, if, if you're giving testimony on behalf of the city, uh, Mr. Mayor, then um, I, I would ask that um, if you're conveying the sentiment to the council is, is that, um, you know, it, while we don't take an official position, um, that there is, I don't know, reluctance or personal objection or something to that effect as to the, the, the increase in the taxes. But I don't think the city should be taking an official position. Uh, Neil, go ahead. So just like to provide a little bit of data um, because Ryan made a good point about the progressivity of the taxes, but I'd just like to point out where the break points are. There is no recordation tax for a property below $100,000. I'm not sure there are any such properties here in the county. Um, Maybe a parking a, space. A parking space or a shed. Um, there, the, the total increase comes out to about $400 for every $100,000 in value up to a million, and then $800 for every $100,000 beyond that. So, um, so while it is progressive, it's not wildly progressive. Um, and it certainly would would be a big number on any commercial real estate. And that, that market is likely to be much more impacted by COVID because of people tending to work from home going forward. So I'm just, I'm concerned. I'm not sure that one is the end of the world, but uh, again, it's a pretty big increase. About uh, almost 60% of that increase goes to the MCPS CIP and, uh, and almost, uh, and a little over 40% uh, goes to the housing initiative fund for the county. So. The housing initiative fund increase is all pretty much new tax and the CIP is an increase on the existing one. Mike. Yeah, like I said before, I think 
you know, whether these taxes are imposed or not, or the fees are imposed or not, and even given the progressivity that, that Ryan laid out and has now been clarified by Neil, I still think it's important that whatever happens here, uh, that those that revenue that's generated by these fees and taxes needs to uh, accrue to the benefit of our residents, whether you know whether it's for to underwrite affordable housing, uh, in which we'd have to come up with some arrangement with since we have our own housing fund, uh, some arrangement where uh, the county pays pays us or prorate some of that back to us, and also for school impact. Uh, you know, the, the impact on the, the benefit in terms of school construct construction uh, within uh, the areas that are fed by uh, our communities, by the students who live in our community. So, you know, it just has to, our residents need to know that we're standing up for them in terms of how these fees will be used, these, this revenue will be used to benefit the city. Because in the long run, even with this county council that are afraid of a lot of things, including raising fees and taxes, uh, you know, if they end up doing this, we still need to make sure that we're speaking up for our residents, our pro our owners, our property owners. Yeah, I, I think we all we're all yeah. in agreement. Oh, so, and I, you know, I I don't know that I necessarily think that we should be silent on this either. So, anyway. Well, look, Jess. Do you feel like there's enough guidance for you to put together uh, a draft testimony that, that captures everything you just heard here? Well, I, I'm, ha I'm happy to work with you on that. Okay. Um, and certainly, Robin Kirk will be helping and weighing in as well as Dennis, I'm sure, on this. Um, but just quickly, so I can make sure that I've taken correct notes. To summarize, I am a little a little more direction for the red policy areas, the 5.6. I know that there was some concern raised by members on our recommendation to support that um, the elimination of the red policy area recommendations that we, we would not object in our comments to that. Um, Council members, we've heard we've heard from Neil on it. Ryan, I think you've characterized yourself as being queasy about this. Um, I know Council Member Sesma had a few so, comments. Yeah, I had. So, you know, I understand that these are metro areas and urban areas, but I, I my question earlier was going to be what are the implications in, in terms of redevelopment of Lake Forest where there is a transit center? And also the fact that we have at least four transit-oriented developments within the city that happen to be, uh, you know, uh, either on the uh, the CCT route or along 270. So uh, we are certainly we certainly have communities that are dependent on transit oriented develop on on the development of of uh, practical public transit. So um, uh, they were conceived that way years ago. But so to the question that long ago. So the question is, yeah, I, I I do have an objection that we're not included in that. Okay. I want to know the implications for, especially for an, uh, where we're looking to redevelop uh, at Lake Forest. Okay, so Jess, there, there's a majority uh, concern here about the elimination of the red areas. Um, I, I would add, I mean, my position was not necessarily that we sort of go all out guns blazing in opposition to it, but that, you know, we express mm -hmm you know, perhaps we're not going to take a position on it or not object to it, but in doing so, uh, you know, sort of diplomatically tack on an expression of concern to ensure that, you know, future planning efforts don't uh, discourage or disincentivize uh, development in the mid-county, that, that sort of thing. That was kind of my position. So maybe it's a bit of a wishy-washy. No, 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 no. I, 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 that's, that's the way we would do this. Yeah. I'm not hearing, yeah, I'm not hearing an outright, except from Neil, I'm not hearing <laughs> an outright rejection of it. So I think uh, we can characterize this cer certainly a concern. What do you, what, what's next on your list, Jess? Um, and then um, it sounded like to me that everyone concurred with staff recommendations for 4.1, 4.4, and 4.5. And then the final part about the taxes, 
is that it sounds like a lot of these comments will be started with, um, well, we don't have an official position. We would like to, you know, voice our concern or would like the council to be um, mindful of this. Um, as far as the chapter six goes and the recordation taxes. Um, so that's, that's in my notes really quickly what I, what I heard, um, but I wanna you know, just make sure that that's the direction that staff should take. Yes, and by staff, that's you and me. <laughs> we're, writing, we're writing the testimony. Um, I'd I often think of myself as staff, but I'm not staff. Yeah, I think to me, if I may, Mr. Mayor, I mean, sorry to jump in, but to sort of synthesize where the conversation was sort of drifting towards uh, on, on those items. Again, it's, we're not, you know, we're not guns blazing coming out and saying we oppose this tax increase, but we are saying, um, you know, that as we go forward, there should be a considered sensitivity to the economic downturn, people struggling uh, in this area, in this, in this era of COVID, and um, you know sensitivity and thoughtfulness before we start increasing uh, recordation tax and other taxes and uh, a sort of a piggyback to that um, whether the brackets outlined uh, and the precise percentages outlined um, in the proposed recordation tax increase are the right mix and the right uh, 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 transition points along the brackets and the range of uh, the cost of real estate uh, that make the most sense to ensure that we're not penalizing people at the lower end of the scale uh, while still uh, taking advantage of the slack at the higher end of the scale uh, in the real estate market. So again, I think it's, you know, Mr. Mayor, it's saying, look, we're not, we're not opposed. I, I, we get it. We're not, we're not yeah. sticking our fingers in what the county decides to do with its tax increases or non-increases but it should think about these things and you know we think about these things for our constituents so. and like the mayor said this is just a public hearing there won't be a vote it will go to a transportation committee so we'll have opportunity to have input with the transportation committee members with president Katz, before there's any final vote on what this will look like so we do have an opportunity to provide more detailed input all right uh jess kirk rob thank you all very much Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, next, uh, we have from the city attorney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just do have one item this evening. I did send to you all kind of midweek last week a confidential memo regarding the city of Portland versus United States of America case. Uh, this is an appeal before the Ninth Circuit of um, three orders that the Federal Communications Commission um, issued in 2019, which impact local government's authority over their public rights of way. Um, a three panel group of the FCC did enter an order last month. Uh, it was kind of a mixed bag. Uh, there were some wins in it for local government and some wins in it for uh, the industry. Uh, we would like to request uh, the right to participate in a petition for en banc review uh, before the entire Ninth Circuit Court. So I'm seeking authorization from the Merit Council to do so this evening. I see Rob Wu nodding his head. I see Mike. I see Ryan. I see Lorianne. Neil is not, he's inscrutable. We don't know what's happening <laughs> with Neil. But either, we have a majority. So yes, go, go right ahead. Okay, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, that is due by September 28th, so we appreciate your su support. And again, we'll be part of a nationwide coalition of local governments participating in this litigation. All right, wishing our team the best of luck. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming there's not nothing from any other staff. If there is, raise your hands, guys. If not, then I will remind everyone that we have a work session next week with our report from the racial equity cohort and um, discussion about all kinds of things, uh, uh, vendors and uh, equity policies and street names. That's next week, September 14th. Uh, the next regular meeting of the Mayor and Council is on Monday, September 21st. Until next time, Let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned.